Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Turn this down a little bit. It's loud. Hey, that's better. Uh, welcome to Conowingo Baptist Church. I'm very thankful to uh, to have you all here today uh, to worship with us, and we are here to worship Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, uh, the one who is the master of all of our life, and the one who came down here to redeem and to pay for uh, a world that was lost in sin and death. And so we are here today to praise the name of Jesus Christ. And we are very thankful that you are here to join with us in that. So if you are a visitor today, there is a little welcome card in front of you. In the pew in front of you, it says welcome. And you just take that out, fill out a little card in there, and then when the offering plate goes around, you can drop that in the offering plate. We'll collect it up, and we will contact you in the week or weeks to come to follow up with you about what it is that God's doing in your life. And we're very thankful to have our visitors here today. The Deacon of the Week is Brother Greg Roth, and so the way that the Deacon of the Week works is that if you have an issue in your home. It could be uh, just, you know, you've got a pipe that's messed up or something's going on. You've got a bill that needs you can have some help with rent or electricity or something. Uh, you contact the church and then we coordinate through the deacon of the week to uh, get that need taken care of for you in which, whatever way we can. We can't guarantee that everything's just going to, you know, all, all of a sudden be taken care of. But whatever we can do, we will. And we truly really do strive as a church to uh, serve the community in that way. And so uh, the Deacon of the Week is Brother Greg Roth. There's going to be a nursery worker meeting and really a nursery meeting after the service. It's going to be right over here in the wing on this side. And so after the service, if you are involved in the nursery, um, we are going to be having a meeting right over there to discuss some of the policies and procedures and uh, recommendations and things like that of the nursery. Next Sunday, there's going to be a benevolence offering. So just as we talked about the Deacon of the Week, uh, it helps to coordinate and help take care of bills and things like that. We have a specific offering that we use for that, and it's called benevolence. It is an offering that we take up uh, alongside the regular offering just for those needs in the community. So next week when you come back, just remember um, that we're going to be taking up those two offerings and it's not like we're taking up two because we didn't get enough or whatever. You take the one for the regular and then the second offering will go around that's specifically for benevolence to help out with these particular needs in our community. Also next Sunday, there was a new members class that happened this past week. Uh, but we went ahead and rescheduled it. So next Sunday, we're going to have a new members class. And it's going to be right after the regular service. And so after the Sunday service is over, we're going to have lunch provided for you. And if you want to participate in that new members class, you just come downstairs to the fellowship hall after the service. We'll feed you some lunch. And then we'll go through a couple of the, it'll be a shortened version of the new members class. But you're going to get the important things. You're going to learn what we believe, why we believe it, and you're going to learn about your uh, place in this church and, and the gifts that God has uh, built you with and how those gifts match up with the ministries right here at Conway Baptist Church. So I want to invite everybody, anybody who's interested in coming to that new members class, we're going to have that next Sunday uh, right after the service, and, uh, and we would love to have you. There's no cost for that, and you're not required to do it, but we would love to have you. All right, at this time, I would like to invite Brother Ron to come up and to speak to us about Awana. Am I saying that right? Awana. No, I'm saying right. <laughs> and then if you could pray, you're done. <laughs> Throw that out at you. In front of everybody. Yes. I have to ask that. <laughs> um, Awana. Okay. Awana is going to start up on September 13th, which is um, about three Wednesdays from now. Okay. It runs the course of the school year, and it runs until May. And, um, and so when school's out, and Awana's over, and then we do the summer thing. Um, so. I'm up here to talk about Awana, but I also want to talk about what's kind of going on this summer. Um, we have 
kids coming on Wednesdays, even though Awana is not going on during the summer. We have kids coming up here, and um, anywhere from like pre-K up to about fifth grade. And we have uh, Sandra's class down here on the, in the bottom, and they're like they're doing about second through fifth grade, and pre-K through first or second, depending on the kid. Um, is what we do in the children's church room. Um, we have video lessons that we've been doing with the kids, um, playing games and whatnot. But we're loving the kids and teaching them what's what's in the Bible age appropriate, right? Um, and some of the kids that we've been dealing with, they come here to us at our church and they're hearing the Word of God, and they're not hearing it anywhere else. They're not hearing it at home. And that's not all the kids. That's just some of the kids. Um, but anyway, they're not hearing it, okay? Um, I want the kids to learn God's Word. I want the kids to know what the Bible is, what is the Bible, where it comes from. You know, it's the truth, it's the light, right? I want them to know that. Um, so... Um, we pray before we, you know, when we eat our little snacks and all, we pray, right? And we're ready for kids. And when we leave, we pray. And we average maybe four to six, you know. Um, we met a little boy a couple of weeks ago that's been coming. His name is Logan. And he lives in the trailer park. And there's some kids out on Mountain Road close to where Mr. Jim and Sheila live. There's about four of them out there, most of them are girls. And so when we pray, of course, they raise their hand. Kids are very brave, so they raise their hand. Yes, I want to pray. And then when we say, okay, um, you know, go ahead. And let's, let's go ahead and pray. Um, they, didn't, they don't say anything. The, these, these couple that I'm talking about, kids, they don't say anything. And so, you know, I kind of, you know, ask them, you know, okay, is it going to be praying silently? Or, and they look up at me and they ask, Okay, we're talking five, you know, one girl is four, so four or five years old. And um, I cried off of a hat, I'll just tell you that. <laughs> um, These kids are a blank canvas. And they're asking the, the they're asking a very a huge question. How in the world do you pray? And as adults, I want you to think about that. You know, when you when you were when you first prayed, when you first accepted Jesus Christ, or when you first was around I'll call it church stuff, okay? And the question probably entered your mind, because I know it did me, you know, how do you pray? What is it? And for a five-year-old kid to ask that, you know, it's huge. And so that is like a huge opportunity that you want to take advantage of, right? So you go over and you, you pray with this kid, okay? And it's nothing mind-blowing, it's just a simple little prayer for a five-year-old kid. But it's, it's, it's huge. It's one of the biggest things you can do, right? Um, I've got like things that I was going to talk about up here, but my mind is, um, is focusing on these kids this last couple of weeks. Um, and it gets me to a wanna. Those same kids that are in pre-K, in what we call pre-K during the summer, they're going to be in what they call cubbies, okay? And in cubbies, going over the kids that will probably be here, there's about eight. And we're talking three-year-old to five, depending on when the kid starts kindergarten, okay? Um, we need help there. We need help there. Because... In children's church, we might have eight kids in there and two adults. But you're not going over verses with the kids like one-on-one, -on -one, right? You're, you're in there as a group. You're in there for an hour and they're in 
church. This is something more detailed, Awana is. You're not only going over a page in a book with these kids and the verse that's on the page in the lesson. These kids are going to have questions. And it's going to be a week in, week out thing because we don't all teach children's church every week. Like, we're in there this week, uh, me and Eva and Laura, and next week we won't be. Um, these kids, they need to know that, for example, Miss Alexis. Okay. Well, Miss Alexis, she's the one that heads up the cubbies, right? And so they go there, they learn Miss Alexis, and they know that Miss Alexis is going to love on them, and, uh, you know, and that she is, they learn to trust her, right? And that she, when she talks, when she teaches of them about, about God's Word, that, um, you know, in other words, they connect with her, right? They, they, they learn to trust her, and, and, uh, and in turn, <coughs> They kind of open up and and start to learn, start to ask questions. Um, that's where we need help. Okay, we need um, we need more adult volunteers in Cubs, all right? Because Alexis and Janice, Janice is going to be in there as well. Um, if they're talking to this boy or girl. Than the others, you know, they need time as well, and um, and there's things that sick children, okay, Lexus is a mom, right? Maybe, maybe he's sick, maybe she has to go and uh, attend to her son, okay. Um, but we need more help, right? We need to, we need um, people to come in and work with children, not just pre-K. Another group is K through second, okay? Ms. Cindy Roth is in there, and her daughter Jen as well. Um, we need people that will come in and work with Sparks as well, K through second grade. Um, that is our biggest, you're talking 12 to 15 kids a night, and uh, we need more adults in there, all right? They have even more questions than the pre-K. Um, uh, we need help there, and we also need maybe some help in TNT, probably. Um, game time is important. Um, we need people that will come in and just play with kids. All right? That's what we need. Um, AWANA, I'll say this, uh, AWANA stands for um, Approved Workers Are Not Ashamed. All right, and that comes from 2 Timothy 2.15 is what it's based on. Um, I want to read this. Uh, this is Isaiah 55, 10, um, 10 to 11. It says here, For just as rain and snow fall from heaven and do not return there without saturating the earth and making it germinate and sprout and provide um, seed to sow and food to eat, so my word, that's capital M, God, my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but will, it will accomplish what I please and will proper, uh, prosper in what I send it to do. Um, God sent his word here for a mission, for a purpose. Um, you can think of these little kids as, you know, little seeds that are sprouting up, right? We have a lot of kids around here. Um, you know, what are they learning? What is, what are they growing on? What are they growing in? Okay? Um, I want them to grow in God's Word. I want them to know it. And, uh, and I think that that will change our, you know, our area, our community, you know, if we, if we minister to our children. <laughs> Um, but anyway, thank you. I know I'm scatterbrained, but God did not make me to be a Donald Trump, okay? I'm not going to stand in front of an auditorium full of thousands of people and talk, all right? Um, I, am, I am who I am, and 
uh, I love children, and uh, I want to see them grow in God's Word. I need, I need your help, is what I'm saying. And long story short, I need your help. Um, yes, ma'am. I just really feel God putting it on my heart to say this. We, we need to reach the children when they're young. I always thought that God was leading me to teach women, you know. It feels like God is making me have a desire to reach out to the little ones. And I was speaking to a friend, she said, yes. Have we not noticed the devil working over time to corrupt the youngest and younger and younger and younger? And younger? We have to catch them when they're young. And the world is going to snatch them up and take them away. And if we're waiting for them to be youth, well, I think that's too late. I really think we need to instill in the little ones our God's love. And I'm just appealing for everyone to feel that. Because time is very short. Time is very short. Thank you. All right. I'm off to play with kids. <laughs> oh, no. I will. I told you. God, I'm sorry. <laughs> Preacher, I'm sorry. <laughs> so first of all, Josh, Josh, I love, I love this man, Josh. Um, I've known him for many years, as you know. Um, and um, he, to me, he wears two hats. He's my brother in Christ. Uh, you know, he, he's, he's an awesome friend. And. Uh, Alright. See if we can get through this. <laughs> Alright. Um Father God. <clears throat> um, as always, as I say this all the time, I come to you today and uh, and Father, I thank you for another day. I thank you for more opportunity. Um Father, I thank you for those that are here. Uh, Father, I, I thank you for your word that is about to be preached by our pastor, Mr. Josh McCord. Um, Father, I pray that, uh, that you would speak through him, that you would, um, you would use him to, uh, to speak to us. Um, about your word. Teach us, teach us about your word. Father, let us know um, your will. Let us know what you desire of us, Father. Let us know um, let us know. Father, I pray that we would be here with open hearts, open ears, open minds. Uh, Father, if anything that you speak to, Josh, uh, hits us, pokes us in the heart, Father, I pray that we would receive that the right attitude. Uh, Father, that we would accept it as uh, as perfection, as light, which is what your word is. Uh, Father, I invite you into this, into your house, into this church service as we worship you today and sing and, and read your word. Um, Father, I pray these things in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing this morning. Uh -huh.
Good morning. It's time for us to pray over the offerings that are being brought to us today into this church house. Lord, I want to offer up this prayer that these monies that are brought to us today are used to go out and be of service to you in this community, into this church, to wherever you should have us go, Lord. Not only in this church, but I have uh, this feeling and this continuing word that I'm hearing today is about our heart. I, I want to see in this church as people experience a feeling in their heart where you are meant to go out, whether it's in work or money, whatever you can provide, Lord, I pray at this time that we are a church of one heart that is, sees Jesus at work here. Lord, I pray that this time, this money again, be used in your service. And by the power of your spirit that's in us, your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Your royal blood. Your blood. 
Jesus, we just thank you for the sacrifice on Calvary, the sacrifice of your blood that covers our sins. The scriptures say that our sins are as far as the east is from the west. That we don't have to worry about them. We, we know that in your word you say that you, if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Father, we, forgive, we ask you to forgive. Forgive us for when we walk away. Forgive us when we are selfish. Father, let our hearts be focused on you as your word is presented through Pastor Josh, through our songs this morning, that Jesus, you would convict of how we've walked away from you and how we are selfish. Jesus, we love you. And we pray that we will praise you forever and ever and ever. It is in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. This song is called Ever Be. And the chorus is very simple. It's just your praise will ever be on our lips. And as we sing these words, let it be a prayer that we will sing your praise forever and ever and ever for all eternity and then some.
message today is continuing a series called His Story. And we are looking in the Old Testament, we're seeing themes and pictures of Jesus' ministry and the gospel all throughout the Old Testament. And the subtitle today is Love in Your Heart. Love in Your Heart. We're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 6, looking at verses 4 through 15. And I invite you to read along in your Bible with me out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not fill, houses full of all good things which you did not fill, hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. When you have eaten and are full, then beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve Him and shall take oaths in His name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word today. We thank you for this promise of your love being in our hearts. And it is a love that you demonstrated perfectly on the cross as you died for us. That you demonstrated perfectly in the tomb as you took our sins to the grave. And which you demonstrated perfectly as you resurrected, rising from the grave, providing perfect love that casts out all fear and all death and all suffering, victory over sin and death that you offer to us. We go into your law today very reverently, seeing your character and God seeing your heart. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. The first section today that we're going to look over is Hear the Love. Hear the Love. It says, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That word hear in the Hebrew is Shema. It's the traditional Jewish description of this statement. And it acts as the fundamental summary of of the entire Jewish law. When they say the Shema, they're talking about this and the next verse together. Hear, O Israel, let all the people of God hear what is about to be spoken. And then he says the Lord. And we've talked about it many times, but the Lord in all capital letters in your Bible represents God's personal holy name, Yahweh. And then it says, the Lord our God. That word God there in Hebrew is Elohim. It is the word God in the general sense of a God. And that is why we will look at why it says our God. But that word Elohim, we're going to look into later as well. But it says the Lord is one. In 
in the Hebrew again, it would have just said Yahweh one. You wouldn't have had any of these other words around it. It would have just said Yahweh and then one. Grouping them together eternally saying there is only one God. What this statement tells us is absolutely non-negotiable when it comes to God's personal theology. Theology is the understanding of who God is and what He does. This is non-negotiable. What that means is that you and I can disagree on a lot of things in Scripture. But if we disagree on the Shema, we disagree about a fundamental truth about God. So if you don't believe that God's personal name is Yahweh, we're talking about a different God. If you don't believe that God is our God, as in the nation of Israel, we're not talking about the same God. If you believe that God is just one God among all the other gods that all lead to the same thing, we are not talking about the same God. Non-negotiable. So first it says there are no other gods except Yahweh. There's only one God. And I'm telling you, if there's one thing that Satan is telling and promoting in this world, it's that there are multiple gods. You see that bumper sticker that says coexist, and I'm not judging you if you have that bumper sticker. I'm just saying that bumper sticker is garbage. <laughs> when we get to heaven and God says He is one God and there is no other, and we only get there by the blood of the Lamb, all the other religions that claim that there are also another way are not going to be there. Second, Yahweh is our God. He is the God of our specific person, our being. You are an individual soul specifically created by God. He is your God. But collectively, as the family of God, who we have put our faith in Jesus Christ, He is our God. He's speaking here to the nation of Israel, and we know from the New Testament, as we have seen many times, that if we are believers today, we are grafted in. We become adopted into the family and nation of Israel. So all the promises given to them are given to us through Jesus Christ. Third, Yahweh is a community within Himself. This is where we get to this idea of Yahweh, meaning I am that I am, Elohim, meaning God, but that word Elohim is actually a plural word. The word in Hebrew says gods. So it says Yahweh, the one true God, and it's gods, our gods, and then it says Yahweh is one. We're going to look at that. But the idea is that our God is a community, a common unity, even within Himself. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our God represents Himself. There's only one God. He represents Himself in three very distinct ways or ministries right here on planet Earth. So there are, within this verse, exactly three Descriptions and identifiers of our God. This is not a coincidence. Three in one. Yahweh, our Elohim, Yahweh is one. And yet the entire emphasis of this verse points to that very end fact. And the Jews understand it this way. That our God is one. So when you see cults that knock on your door and they say, you know, Jesus is just one of many gods. But He was the Son, as in like the Father is one God and the Son is another God. This verse, God is saying, no, He's not. They're taking another Jesus to your doorstep. Our God is one. That's the whole purpose of this verse. And we will see Jesus absolutely identifies that as well. But Father, Son, Holy Spirit, within Himself, He is a relational being. He is, he is a God who wants and desires relationship. And that's why we are built as well with this relational community in our mind. He has a name. It is Yahweh. He has a relationship. He is our God. He has a holiness. There is only one God and there is none other like Him. Verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. 
this verse is always connected to the verse prior to it. It's so foundational that when Jesus was asked, what's the most important commandment in all of Scripture? This is exactly what he quotes. Mark 12, 28 to 30. One of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well. So the scribe comes up, Jesus is giving some amazing answers. Excuse God. And he's like, hey, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And then he will go on to say, the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. But the first, among all the hundreds of laws in the Old Testament, the first and therefore most important, most prominent of all the laws is to love God. We see why this is the most important. First is the confession of all the truths that we just discussed in verse 4. The confession of all those truths makes it extremely important. That's why it's non-negotiable. God is one. Hear, O Israel. Yahweh, our Elohim. Yahweh is one. But second, so you have the confession of all the truths. Super important. Second is the sacrificial love that is tied to our eternal life in Christ. This word, as Jesus uses it, is agape love. That is the same sacrificial love Jesus used to die on the cross. You and I are intended to have a sacrificial type love of our one true God. This means we don't say we love Him and then go live like we hate Him. We sacrifice the sins and the desires of our hearts in order that we may show God, I love you. Here's my life as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to you. I love you. Third is that we see the, the multi-dimensional nature of our being. It's critical that we understand. This is why this verse is so prominent and so important. Look at this. He doesn't just say, oh, just you as a body. He says, heart, soul, mind, strength. We have multiple dimensions of who we are in our being. And there's a reason for that. We are created in the image of God. In the same way He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we have multiple dimensions of our character. And fourth, the expectation of total worship. With every one of these, He says, I want you to do this with all of you. All of you. Complete worship. A great aspect of the New Testament is that we actually get to, to see a direct interpretation of this verse from the Old Testament. We get to see a direct interpretation from Jesus Christ Himself. But the way we get that interpretation is from a very unlikely source, and that's actually through the scribe. The best way, as we say many times, the best way to interpret Scripture is with Scripture. So look at what it says, continuing in Mark 12, the next couple verses. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth. For there is one God, and there is no other but He. And to love Him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love one neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. The scribe says there's one God, there's no other, and that we should love Him with all our heart, all our understanding, and all of our strength and soul. The love, he says, is more important than all the burnt offerings and all of the sacrifices. That's the scribe's interpretation. So he's saying, when I look at the law, I see that you are magnifying two principles. One, that you are one God, there is no other. Second, that, that loving you is more important than any of the acts of service I could ever do for you. So Jesus says, you have answered wisely. Verse 34. You're not far from the kingdom of God. It's because Jesus gives us answer that He answered wisely that we know He answered the truth. 
Jesus wouldn't say, oh, that's a very wise answer if it was a lie. So this is extremely wise. The scribe's interpretation we get is Jesus' interpretation. He says, you can answer very wisely, but he says, you're not far. Which means the scribe was real close, but he wasn't there yet. What an important lesson that we have been seeing, and we're going to see again right here. Even if you understand all of the law, even if you understand all the gospel and all of its, the different facets, if you do not connect that Jesus is the reason for all of your existence and everything that, that has ever been created, if you don't connect that Jesus is Yahweh God, you are real close, but you're missing it completely. That's what separates the lost from the saved. That Jesus is Yahweh God. His name means Yahweh saves. That God meant to be the scribe's personal, true God. That God meant to be our nation of Israel, our God. Jesus, the one true God, part of the blessed Trinity as the Son, also recognize. That as a scribe is right here speaking to Jesus, he's saying, isn't this the truth? There's only one God. I'm supposed to love him and everything. And he's got that God right in front of him. He never turns and says, I love you, Jesus. I need forgiveness from you, Jesus. And I can tell you, there's a lot of Christians sitting in a lot of churches who say they, they profess that Jesus is their Lord, and they have never looked to Christ and said, Christ, I'm sorry because I sinned against you and you alone. Christ, I'm ready to follow you as my Lord and Savior. I've been playing church and I've been doing a lot of different things that were not, absolutely not in accordance with what you say. I am lost. This is how close you, Jesus could stand right here in this room and no one would be saved just because he's standing here. You could come right up to him, walk right, you could brush him with your arm. You could say, I know you're Jesus. You could say, I believe, like you died on the cross. I believe it. And you could walk out of this church lost. It's not about what you see. It's not about what you hear. It is about what is happening in your heart. Has your heart ever been broken to the point that you realize you need a Savior and Jesus is that Savior. This is a command that implies action. We are commanded to love. Verse 6, These words which I command you today shall be where? In your heart. You know, much has been said in recent years about accepting Jesus into your heart. And there's the pendulum swings real far saying that's not even biblical. It doesn't ever say to accept Jesus in your heart. I beg to differ. It says right here in the law. In your heart. This is where the commands will be. This is where it has to happen. Now there's a very good reason that people have gone against that because just simply praying a prayer and saying some words doesn't save anybody. Making it some sort of, some sort of like emotional response where the lights are dim and the music is playing and they're like, man, I, all right, everybody head down and you know, eyes closed. I don't want anybody to step out and like whatever. I, you know, just, just, hey, just put your hand up. Right now. Okay, put it down. Don't want anybody to see it. We would hate for you to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior to the whole world. We'd hate to embarrass you or to inconvenience you. So we're going to use emotional tactics. You know why people with their head bowed, eyes closed, hands go up, and they go down so nobody can see you know why people walk out of there years later going, I really don't know if I'm saved. I mean, I had a preacher tell me I must be saved, but like, I don't know if I'm saved. Because they're not. Because they're not. I said this last week, I'm going to say it again. You can convince a lost person they're saved. You can never convince a saved person they're lost. If you don't know if you're saved, you're lost. When the God of the universe comes to dwell inside your body, you're not going to question it. You're not going to be like, man, this feels a lot like when I eat ice cream. <laughs> and yet, when you eat ice cream, do you ever doubt it? I doubt it. I doubt if I've eaten ice cream. I'm just not sure. The God of the universe, you're either saved or not. Like, he either lives inside you or he doesn't. 
If you don't know, then you know. You're not saved. You're not saved. The scribe had spent his whole life studying. He memorized scripture, all of it. That's what they did. And here he's standing in the presence of God, and Jesus is telling him, man, you're, dude, you're so close. I think you're like a foot from God right now. But you're not there. <coughs> Being a disciple of Jesus is not about praying a prayer and inviting Jesus to be a bystander as we just continue to lead our lives in sin. Being a disciple of Jesus means surrounding and surrendering our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. To Him dying for our previous life of sin and death. It's not fluffy. It's not flights of fancy. It is ground-shaking, earth-shattering power of the resurrection of the God of the universe. That's the effect of repentance and faith in Jesus. And when we do what Jesus commands us to do, He says, yeah, these words shall be in your heart. A scientific description of this recent research of our heart says this. I'm just going to let you guys read along with me. The heart contains a little brain in its own right. Yes, the human heart. This is written by a psychologist who's also done a lot of work. This is one of many articles that have come out in the last decade or two about this thing. Just, we'll just keep reading. Yes, the human heart, in addition to its other functions, actually possesses a heart brain composed of about 40,000 neurons that can sense, they can feel, they can learn, and they can remember. The heart brain sends messages to the head brain about how the body feels and more. When I first heard about this scientific research, it intuitively made sense. I had felt for a long time that the heart had its own mysterious way of knowing. And until the 1990s, scientists assumed, and most of us were taught, that it was only the brain that sent information and issued commands to the heart. But now we know it actually works both ways. In fact, the heart's complex intrinsic nervous system, the heart brain, is an intricate network of several types of neurons, neurotransmitters, proteins, and support cells like those found in the brain proper. Research has shown that the heart communicates to the brain in several major ways and acts independently of the cranial brain. One important way the heart can speak to and influence the brain is when the heart is coherent. What that means is generating a stable, sine wave-like pattern in its rhythms. When the heart rhythm is coherent, then the body, including the brain, begins to experience all sorts of benefits, among them greater mental clarity, intuitive ability, including better decision making. Some of y'all are reading that, you're like, all right. <laughs> Your God built you with a brain in your heart. We're just now discovering it. We're just now understanding how this thing works. You also have a brain in your stomach. That's why people have been saying, like, man, it's just like a gut instinct. There's actually science to that. You have a brain in your stomach. You have a more important brain in your heart. The brain in your heart has a lot more to do. It's actually, it starts here, and then it works up. And your, your heart is making decisions before your brain ever does. And this is why you're like, man, I just I feel like this is the right thing. It doesn't even feel like it makes sense here, but all of a sudden you're like, it just feels like I think this is the right thing. It's your heart. Our God built us to literally allow the brain in our heart to override the brain in our head so that we work better when we surrender our hearts to God. That surrender to our God has the eternal positive effect of salvation and obedience. In other words, when our heart surrenders to Jesus... Jesus becomes our pacemaker, allowing us to love and to live in rhythm with His Word. So what does life look like when we're living by His Word? Verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children, talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. So when it says teach them, the them is His commands. The words, verse 6, which I command you today, that's the them. We are to teach them the words of Yahweh. Is it possible to teach something that you don't have any idea about? Are you, are you able to teach something to somebody that you're clueless over? 
Some people try to. Doesn't mean they're doing it. No. How do we learn the words of God? Not just by reading the Bible, but by studying the Bible. I'm going to put two resources up here. One is blueletterbible.org. Blueletterbible.org. It's a screenshot of their homepage. You go to the top of there, there's a word, it's a link that says study. You're like, I want to know how to study the Bible. Blueletterbible.org. Right there. Study. Click that link, start studying the Bible. It's free. It's awesome. Blueletterbible.org. There's also an application you can put on your uh, mobile devices. There's Logos, Bible study software. There's also Accordance. This is a picture of Accordance. What you see here on the left, that's the scriptures. You hover over a word, it shows the Greek or the Hebrew. And then you can do all sorts of different searches for that word or for that idea. Commandments, commentaries, places in scripture, maps, all that stuff. It's going to cost you money. A lot of money to get more books, to get more Bibles, to get more commentaries. But if you invest the same as you would with Netflix, about 120 bucks a year, you're getting eternal truths that will last forever. I don't know. You make the decision. <laughs> so once we study God's Word, we're commanded to teach it, and then our work is done, right? We teach it whenever we find some free time, whenever it's convenient. No. He says, teach them diligently. That word diligently is sharp. You ever had to work with a knife that's not sharp? Does it not take longer to cut things? The other day I tried to cut a watermelon with a butter knife. I didn't do that. I'm not an idiot. <laughs> I appreciate your sorrow, but <laughs> A sharp knife is an effective knife. Are you sharpening your understanding of the Word of God? Are you able to teach diligently the Word of God to those around you? So, where do we teach the Word of God? First and foremost, what does it say? Your children. What did you hear from Ron? What did you hear from Miss Cindy? If we're not teaching the children, what are we doing? Some of us are in here like, I don't teach the Word of God to anybody. Sweet. Start with the children. We have this whole ministry called Awana. You can teach children. Like, I don't really know if I'm ready to do that. Listen to other people teach. It's a great way of learning how to teach. Awana is a ministry where we're teaching children the Word of God because it's a commandment of God to do so. Teaching children is our responsibility as the church. We are never commanded to let our kids go out and figure things out by ourselves and by themselves. What's the one thing you know your kid's going to figure out by the time they're about two or three years old? How to lie and how to cover it up. That's the kind of stuff they figure out. You send out a high school student after they graduate, oh, just go and I just hope you figure things out. What do you think they're going to figure out? How to lie, how to cover it up. Sin, that's what we figure out by ourselves. We have to teach the Word of God. In order to hear and understand that we need a teacher. Somebody can help us out and then we teach the Word of God. The second thing in the area where it says the first children, second says when you sit in your house, use your home as an opportunity for discipleship. Invite people over. Open a Bible. Speak about the Word of God. Your home is a place God expects us to disciple. Third, it says when you walk by the way, use your job or use your circumstances for discipleship. Everywhere you go, look at opportunities to share the gospel. Being led by the Spirit. I'm not saying just go around to every person like on the street, okay, hold on, i got to talk to you. Okay, hold on, i got to talk to you. No, be led by the Spirit, but be open to the fact that He is going to lead you somewhere. Fourth, it says, when you lie down. Have you ever rested for discipleship? Rested as a commandment from the Lord? In other words, you're trying so hard to get everything done and to do it all, and you're like exhausted? And maybe God, if you would just stop and listen, He's saying, why don't you sit down and rest? He says, when you lie down. And then He says, when you rise up. This has been a wonderful, wonderful discipline that the Lord has given me. Every day I wake up, I open my eyes, first thing I do is I start thanking God. First of all, hey, I woke up, another day. <clears throat> but second, that He would begin that moment to, to direct my feet that day. God, 
tell me where to go. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? Every morning, I get up, I wake up. First thing I do, I thank God, I praise God that wake me up. Praise Him for He is. Now, God, direct my day, direct my path. Wherever you want my feet to go, I'll go. When you rise. Concluding point number one, hear the love. Always listen to Jesus. This is the longest section, so don't freak out. This is the longest section. It's the Shema. It needed a lot. Jesus says, Jesus says the most important commandment in all scripture. Hey, it's got to take time. It's not a microwave. Always listen to Jesus. Hear the love. Always listen to Jesus. Always listen to Jesus. He says, hear, O Israel. Second section is to see the love. See the love. Verse 8. He says, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. That bind them is attaching them, making them one as a sign. A constant reminder on your hands and in the frontlets. That's like your forehead. These are actions, signs. They, they are something that show something. It would become a mark on your hand and a mark on your forehead of what? The Word of God. The things you do and the way you think. Is there a marker that everything you do and everything you think, that the Word of God is the foundation of it? What we do and what we think is a sign of who it is that we belong to. Revelation 13, 16 to 17, they call this kind of like the anti-Shema, the opposite of the Shema. It says, this is talking about the Antichrist, right? The false prophet, the beast. This is all bad people in the Bible, all right? We can say, boo, boo, boo. All right, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive what? A mark. Where? On their right hand or on their forehead. And then no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. How does God interpret the taking of the mark of the beast? He equates it with acting and thinking in service to Satan himself. You and I, according to Jesus, his own words tells us we either have a father in heaven and we're serving him, or our father is Satan. He says it's one or the other. There is no middle ground. You're not mostly a good person, just not Satan. Like, you're either serving God, your father in heaven, or you're serving Satan. That's the truth. This is where our world gets a lot of gray and cloudy. God comes in. It's like, no, it's real simple. Like, you're saved and serving Jesus, or you're lost and you're serving Satan. So this is what it says. Look, look, look what happens for everyone who rejects Jesus and chooses to serve Satan. Verses uh, chapter 14 of Revelation 9 to 11. A third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships, you see that? You got the mark? You're worshiping. If anyone worships the beast in his image, receives his mark in his forehead or his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire, brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. The smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. They have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. In God's mind, this mark he's talking about on the hand and on the head is a sign and symbol of worship. So by direct contrast, we are to have God's word as a sign on our hands and a sign on our forehead indicating who it is that we serve as God and King in our life. And if you want further study, you can go to Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 3 to 8. Go to blueletterbible.org and hit study and look at that passage. And you can see the study of the mark. Fascinating study out of Ezekiel. All right, going on to verse 9. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So this word frontlets later on became translated, they started using this term phylacteries. And you see Jesus refer to these phylacteries in verse 23. He's in, uh, in Matthew 23. He says, Matthew 23, 5, But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. The Jews were literally reading this verse about, okay, I want you to take these things and have it as a sign on your arm, a sign of your head. And they were literally making boxes with scrolls of the law in them 
and wrapping them around their head and getting bigger and bigger. And so like they go outside and see their neighbor and be like, oh man, this box is bigger. And they go back and they take bigger boxes and put them on their heads on, and it became these ridiculous signs. And they're like way down, they're like, I can't even lift my head up so righteous, bro. <laughs> God detests acts of righteousness that have nothing to do with Him. This is still going on today. Go ahead and put a picture of it. They still do it today. You see that box on His head? That box on His arm? They still do it today. It's a phylactery. They've got images and diagrams exactly how it should be. Don't be any bigger than this because Jesus made us look bad. There are so many of us who live our life like this. Like maybe if I strap a bumper sticker of a fish on my car, maybe that's the sign. Maybe that's me living it out. We got stuff all over our house, crosses and whatever dangling, and yet when we go out of town, we don't ever say the name of Jesus Christ. We don't tell people, did you know you're a sinner and you need salvation? Our mouths stay closed, but we put boxes on our heads, boxes on our arms, all these signs that we're super uber religious. You're saying you're missing the point. We all share the same God, and He teaches us that only Christ is our teacher. We only have one Father in heaven. If we're teaching anybody, it's because the Holy Spirit is teaching through us. So this binding of His Word on our doorposts and gates of our home has one purpose, that everything we are and everything we have has an identity of Jesus Christ. So ask yourself this question, is your home a sign to the community around you that Jesus is the one true God of the universe? Is that how you use your home? Do people go to your home to be in the presence of a born-again believer? Are the things said and done in your home a reflection of the love that you have for the one true God? Is God's name written in that way on your home? In that way on your life? I will admit, I was lost until I was about 21 years old, and a major influence was the witness of the Christians around me. Because I would ask them questions, and they would give me these answers. of like, it's just a matter of faith. I don't know. I've never read that. And I was so frustrated. As a lost man, I was like, I just want answers. Because a lot of the answers, yeah, it is a matter of faith. We don't know. But you know what? There's a lot of answers in Scripture that there are answers. And we don't know them because we don't love God enough to read it and to study and to dedicate our whole life to understanding His love journal to us. So this is why we can and ought to be a generation who changes that perception and we return to God's command that everything we are should identify ourselves with Him. Verse 10, So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into land which He swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build. This uh, verse begins with a reminder of the promises of God that He made to His nation. And when God promises or swears something, it's 100% going to happen. Just as the promised land for the Hebrews was the city of Jerusalem and its surrounding areas, so too the promised land for you and I as born-again believers is Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem and a new heaven and a new earth and its surrounding areas. All who follow Jesus become the nation of Israel, which means that we receive all the same promises and the same blessings that were sworn to them. And He's going to give us large and beautiful cities that we did not build. Did Jesus talk about that? He sure did. John 14, 2-3, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Not only... Are we not the ones building the cities or homes, but we don't even have to do the traveling to get there. Jesus is coming back to take us to the paradise that he just got done building for us. Verse 11, houses full of all good things, which you did not fill, hewn out wells, which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant. And when you have eaten and are full, pause. God is still describing things he promises to us. It's another indicator of what the purpose of the law being written on the doorposts of the homes. 
Think about it. If God is going to give us new homes and requiring His Word to be on our current homes, He's telling us to be reverent stewards of what we have now, but something better is coming. Houses full of all good things. When God gives us our new home, it's going to be full of all good things. Can you imagine a home where nothing bad ever happens? Can you imagine a home that's just decorated and stocked full by Jesus Himself? He says, but you did not fill wells you didn't dig. Sources of water that require absolutely no work of ours to keep it going. I know some of us have had burst pipes recently and the basement's flooded. <laughs> Imagine that never happening. Vineyards, all trees, didn't plant delicious food ready for the harvest all the time. Do you see how just following and reading the word of God right here in the law, we start to see a declaration of who God is and his character? It's like, I just want to give you good stuff. I don't even want you to have to work for it. I just want to give it to you and bless you with it. It leads to that understanding that He is worthy to be loved. And going further, that His love justifies 100% commitment of our soul, heart, mind, strength. Overflowing into every aspect of our life. It's a love that God initiates. And He promises to bring us into an unimaginable kingdom of beauty and provision. So for all of us who are born again, we live in these very promises. And we read with extreme discernment this next verse. He says, then beware. Lest you what? Forget that the Lord brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Up to this point, we see God just, I'm going to give you this. It's going to be great and amazing. And then he says, so you better beware. You better be real careful about how you deal with this. What do we need to be careful about? Because we have a tendency to forget that God saved us and we had nothing to do with it. It's not about God wanting us to remember the events of that day. It's that God wants us to remember the one who accomplished salvation, Jesus Christ. Lest you forget who brought you out from the house of bondage. We have been saved from the bondage of sin and death, and our God wants us to never forget that He's the one who did this. So follow this. If we know Jesus as the one true God, we love Jesus with every part of our makeup, we serve Jesus with everything He's given us in every circumstance that He takes us into, then we're not likely to forget Jesus because we've given everything over to Him. But if we don't know Jesus as Savior, true God, we don't love Him, we don't serve Him with our whole life, then we are highly likely to forget or not even care that it was Jesus who saved us. And if we forget and we're not giving our lives to Christ, we're going to walk out these doors and live as if it didn't happen because we already forgot. Concluding point number two, see the love. Ever remember Jesus. Ever remember Jesus. Don't forget. The final section is respect the love. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve Him and shall take oaths in His name. There's ten shalls in these twelve verses. One shall not. We'll get to that. But this is part of those. The first thing we see, he says, you shall fear Him, living in respect of God, recognizing His power and His grace. We should serve Him, living obedient to Him, following Jesus in every area of our life. Third, take oaths in His name. That means live in the promises that He said. Don't live in the doubts and the fears of your own self and your own person. Live in the promises that Jesus says, this is how things work. This verse is a declaration of dependence upon Jesus. It's a command from Yahweh to be settled in our hearts about whom we worship. Verse 14, you shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are all around you. The ten shalls are met with this one shall not. If there's one thing you don't want to do, it's this. It says, don't go after other gods. And we say, well, in Egypt, that was easy. So there's statues and towers. And, like, we don't have that now. There's not, like, false gods for me to worship. No. Look at what it says. The gods of the people who are around you. This means if you're in a society, just look around. People are worshiping something. So what does our society worship? Sex, money, fame, smartphones, popularity, beauty, drugs, power, Social media, Pokemon Go, science, health, humanity, in other words, itself. Do you? Do you worship the exact same thing as the society around you? They didn't have more idols and false gods in ancient times. They just did a better job of calling them what they were and building towers and worshiping them. 
Which means that we're just better about lying about what those things really are. They're idols. So ask right now, have I been going after the exact same types of things that my society around me is going after? Well, God commands, you shall not do that. The final verse, the Lord your God is a jealous God. Among you, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. Remember that jealousy only happens with something that, that belongs to you. You're envious of things you don't have. You're jealous when something you have is being used by somebody else. This is why people say, well, how can God be jealous and I'm not supposed to be? Because we don't need it. It's not ours. We didn't create. Nothing actually belongs to us. We're stewards of it. We're managers. God owns everything. So guess what? He's a jealous God. It all belongs to Him. Here we are thinking we're God. We're not. Everything belongs to Him. So He says, yeah, do this in my folly because I'm a jealous God. You belong to me. And when you give yourself out to these other false gods, it makes me angry. That word aroused, again, that's fired up. He's burning anger. He gets very, very angry. For those who have been saved by the blood of the Lamb, you are married to Jesus. He's your groom. We are His bride. And our groom has no desire to see His bride out in town, arms around other false gods. And we shouldn't do that unless we want His anger to burn against us. We are to stay in the truth of His salvation so that He will not destroy us from the face of the earth. There couldn't be any more serious language God gives us to warn us. Destroy us from the face of the earth. I'm going to take you off of this planet if you don't choose the thing that you know to be right. So what do we do? If we've been living in adultery to our God, walking in sin, what do we do? We repent and we decide in our heart who it is who we're going to love and serve right now, right here today. Including point number three, respect the love, only serve Jesus. Only serve Jesus. We are going to have a time of invitation this morning. And if you have heard the Word of God and you recognize that you've been going after other gods, you've been serving something else, you've not been loving God, you've been loving yourself or loving other things, I'm going to invite you to come forward and to repent, to pray to your God and tell Him that you're sorry. If you are here today and you've never been saved, as we were talking earlier, we're like, look, you're either saved or you're not. You've got the God of the universe in you or you don't. You're sitting here and you're like, I think I'm lost. You are lost. Don't walk out lost. Come forward. I'll talk to you about what it means to follow Christ and give your life over to Him. If you've been saved and you've never been baptized and you want to follow in obedience to what God says in His Word, I'm going to invite you to come forward and, be, and we'll talk about you getting baptized. If you feel God leading you to be a member of this church, come forward. All we require is that you're saved, you have a testimony of salvation, and you've been baptized. And we can take care of the baptism, we can't take care of the salvation. We want you to become part of the work God's doing here. I'm going to invite you to stand up this time as we pray for this invitation. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for this most important of all the commandments, just to simply love you. And if we love you and give everything over to you, you give us the strength we need to be obedient in your kingdom. God, if you're speaking to anybody here today, and you're letting them know that, yes, they need to come forward. God, give them the courage <coughs> to stand up and to walk forward. We ask for forgiveness right now for sins we've committed against you. But we pray for the courage to deal with them in exactly the way that you say. God, we pray that you would direct feet and direct hearts right now during your invitation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If God is speaking to you, you come. Don't wait. Just come.